this is the September 21st regular meeting of the Montgomery Independent School District Board of Trustees. I'd like to call this meeting to order by opening with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Dr. Morrison, are there any uh, special recognitions tonight? We do have uh, a special recognition that actually falls uh, at a very appropriate time. Uh, we had already intended to have our first departmental presentation to the board tonight, and it just happens to fall under a time period where we have the opportunity uh, to recognize uh, technology uh, folks. And so I'm going to ask Justin Moreno to come up and uh, want to extol the virtues and the incredible hard work of our technology department here in Montgomery ISD. Moreno, real quick. Good evening, Dr. Morrison, Board of Trustees. Today is I National IT Professionals Day. We wanted to take a moment tonight to recognize our hardworking technology team. Um, you'll hear a lot more about the amazing work happening in their department and a little bit from their director. Um, but I'll let the, uh, the words speak for themselves in a video that we've produced uh, for you. Um, from a, a few of our outstanding principals are featured and they have some things to say about the technology department. technicians play a critical role on our campus. We are very blessed across the district. They come and help us with troubleshooting. They walk in the door. It's what can we do to help? Technicians play a huge role on our campus. It's just having that person there on hand, on the spot, uh, to give you a quick answer or to point you in the right direction when we need something fixed with technology. Our top priority at Technology Services is excellent customer service. And our technicians are the first line of support for department and campus needs. Our technician is all over the place. And they are here to help us make technology an easy focus in the classroom. They're part of the family, they're part of uh, the campus, and we include them in everything we do. They're awesome. They work incredibly hard every single day to ensure that teachers and students have the digital tools that they need to be successful. Our teachers use technology every day in the classroom, and technology has brought a lot of success to Keenan Elementary and all of the other campuses. That technology piece is huge for our kids to get comfortable with it today. In today's digital age, technology has completely changed the way teachers teach and how students learn. I think as a teacher, it connects you to your students. The teachers and students have an opportunity to kind of work together. I also believe that it prepares our students for the future. Here at school is preparing our students not just for what we do in the classroom, but it's preparing our students for everything that happens outside the classroom today and tomorrow. When I say tomorrow, tomorrow five years from now, tomorrow six, seven, ten years from now. Preparing students for the futures they will create begins right here in the classroom. We always talk about making lessons and bringing them alive. They have that opportunity with some of the programs they're able to access and bring those adventures, if you want to say, of life lessons to the classroom. Our technology team works diligently to ensure that the platforms which connect teachers to their students, such as Office 365 and ClassLink, are working properly. It's the support that we now have from our technicians and from the department of what can we do to help and let's try it. Technology, the department has done a great job of putting devices not just in the hands of our students, uh, but making sure we're putting devices in the hands of our teachers. Just getting their new laptops, that's a huge success that our teachers have appreciated and, and for myself knowing that when I am implementing something, they have a computer there at their hands to practice and get the training that they need. And it's not just here, here you go, go learn. Uh, they're providing the time and the opportunity to teach these teachers how to use it to where it's beneficial in the classroom. We are offering professional development opportunities each month that is themed with instruction that is happening in the classroom. So the training, 
the change. It's all been great, and I'm just looking forward to everything in the future and what we can do with technology now in MISD. So just thank you to the technology department, from technicians to everyone involved, to bring the devices, to bring the programs, to put them at our fingertips for teachers and for students. Thank you. From all of us at Technology Services, we are here to serve you. If I may, I'd like to call each of them up to come get a certificate. Um, Director Amanda Davis. We have. Assistant Director Adam Dennison. Diana Teal. And the real boss, Susan Massey. Grayson Ald, uh, David Crow, David David's the jack of all trades. Joe Dukes, uh, Crystal Gentry. We have Miranda Miranda Irvine, um, Matt Keating, Amy King, <laughs> Ky Kyle Smith. Uh, Mario Stewart, and Lewis Summer. Thank you so much to the technology department and uh, you know I can't tell you the number of times that I've ever felt so good about technology so thank y'all so much for everything you're doing. All right um, anything else Dr. Morrison any special recognitions? Yeah. All right so uh, Ms. Whitaker are there any public comments registered? No public comments so we will move now to the consent agenda and board members does anyone wish to pull any items from the consent agenda for discussion? All right, hearing none, is there a motion to approve the consent, consent agenda as, uh, as presented? I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. All right, and a second? Second. Mr. Hopkins, um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed and abstain. That motion carries, consent agenda carries as presented. All right, next up is our sole action item for the evening, and it's a fun one. The, every taxing unit in the county gets the opportunity to offer a number of votes to uh, nominate someone for the Montgomery County, Montgomery Central Appraisal District Board of Directors. In a prior meeting, we have heard from one individual who is currently serving on that board, uh, Mr. Adam Simmons, who is here with us tonight. And uh, Mr. Simmons has expressed his interest in uh, continuing to serve in that capacity. Uh, for that reason, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'll first ask, are there any questions? Do board members have any questions about this process? Okay. If there are none, I would like to nominate Mr. Simmons as Montgomery ISD's uh, nominee for the Montgomery Central Appraisal District Board of Directors and cast our votes in his favor. Are, those, are there any questions about that nominee? Okay, uh, all those in favor? Uh, actually, I need a second. I'll, I'll second. <laughs> I need a second. The president doesn't have to do the uh, motions very often, so <laughs> Ms. Porton has yes. second. Yes. All, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed and abstain, that motion carries. Mr. Simmons, we wish you best of luck in continuing service in that area. So.
All right, so uh, now we're on to information items, which is good for me because I don't have any more action items <laughs> to muddle through. So, uh, First up, TEA accountability star ratings overview. So Thank you, President Fuller. Uh, we're going to ask uh, Dwayne McFadden, our assistant superintendent of secondary schools, but who also dabbles in a little bit of accountability to come forward. Uh, this could be just a one slide uh, because this is where we are statutorily required to share with you our rating from star assessments uh, given in last spring. Uh, as Dwayne will share, there's nothing to share because of obviously the impact of COVID and uh, the, um, the decision by the legislature and TEA not to have that. But we wanted to go a little further than not just uh, talk about ratings, but to talk about um, performance. And we are going to share with you our performance compared to the state and uh, then open up any questions you may have. So Mr. McFadden. Killing my thunder. We have. Uh, you got six slides of thunder. Go for it. <laughs> six slides. Uh, Forty-five minutes, according to the way I go. Uh, you overestimated by about forty minutes. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this would be normally where I would tell you that we're an A-rated district, but, uh, like I did two years ago. But uh, we, since this is uh, a weird year, like all year since we we had pandemic for the last eighteen months. Uh, normally, we'd be getting a letter grade for our district and our campus, but this year, all, all campuses and districts will be rated, not rated, declared state of disaster. So that's not very, uh, uh, you know, something you can hang your hat on, but it's, it's not catchy, but it's what it is. But we've been hearing a lot about COVID slide, and so we thought we need to look at that. We want to know how we're doing in a comparative way to... Uh, the state, uh, how our COVID slide compares uh, and how, how bad it is and what, at what levels it's at. So what is COVID slide? COVID slide is defined as the anticipated drop. And why do we anticipate a drop in star scores? Because we've had kids virtually in front of us and we've had kids virtually at home and we've had kids here in and out because we contact traced all last year. All, so there's been a lot of reasons why we might see a slide in our performance. Uh, and so what we're actually comparing, if I can get this thing to work, is school year 18-19, the pre-COVID star results where we got an A, that was the highest results we'd ever had, compared to last year's uh, star results, which would be COVID impacted. And so we've actually skipped a full year. We gave, remember, we did not give STAR one full year. And so this is comparing where we left when we last gave STAR to last year's results that we just received in August. We just got our results in August. So, and Mr. McFadden, before you go forward, uh, again, just because I know you as a board know this, but for the public, um, again, remember that in the spring of the preceding year, COVID happened, school districts across the state and country shut down. Um, school districts are scrambling to figure out how to do virtual instruction, remote instruction at home. Uh, school districts, including this one, did some heroic work, but no one thinks that that's the best way to educate students. And so you had um, students missing third grade TEKS, fifth grade TEKS, uh, 12th grade uh, assessments, and uh, that lasted through the spring. And then as we came back last year, uh, we, like other districts across Texas, started out remote. Uh, but we were very fortunate to be able to get the vast majority of our kids back by October. Um, and so I, I really want to say all that because when you think about the work of our campus administrators and our campus principals and support staff, uh, there's an awful lot here to understand just how lucky and fortunate we are to have the leaders and teachers that we have in the school district. Absolutely. And I'm going to show you some scores here compared to the state. And what you're going to see is and I didn't change the colors, which is going to probably be a problem. They're green. So ours are green, and I'm just slipped my mind. I don't know the color change. But like, if you look at the first uh, column, you'll see the dark green was from 2019. Our 2021 score is in light green. So we dropped a total of three percentage points between 19 and 21. If you look at the state, the 2019 for the state was 76. They dropped it corresponding to 68 the next year, a total of eight. So our, our slide was not quite as severe as the state slide. Uh, and then you can look across uh, rating for fourth grade, two points, rating for fifth grade, one point. So those are not even really 
really statistically important. We did our, our teachers did a phenomenal job in the classroom and in the hybrid instruction that we were also delivering. And this is in reading through eighth grade. Notice I have one highlighted in eighth grade. That's the only place where our slide was greater than the state slide. And so we got with our principals and we started thinking about what did we do in 2019 that was different, uh, or from 2019 that's been different into the future. And what we did was we unblocked English language arts. And so we're seeing a little bit of a slide, but we think uh, we've got a solution for that. We're looking at our curriculum menu. We went from 94 minutes periods of English language arts to a 45 minute period. And we were able to add what we think is important for all eighth graders. We added a general employability skills class, which is uh, career exploration. It, it gets them interested in CTE classes in the high school. It also teaches them some uh, health issues, uh, mental health issues through our health class. And then it also is a team leadership portion to it, which is, teaches things like making icon, shaking, eye contact, shaking hands, uh, just good uh, relationship building uh, types of traits that we want every eighth grader through that and it lets us allow uh, plan for their career through high school and build their four year plan for high school in that class. So we felt like that was uh, important to do, but we are seeing that we had a slight slide that was a little bit bigger than the state, so that did not escape our purview and we, will, we do have a plan to correct that. You look at math, math is incredible to me. You see, at, say third grade, and I'm, I'm gonna point out third grade, we had a 12 point drop in third grade. The state had a 17 point drop. Why might that be? If you think about third grade, it's where the rigor, th those kids are still learning the basics of math. And so if you went away and you were virtual during that period, it's much harder to learn math and those skills. By the time they get to fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, they have a basic understanding of math, so it's easier to continue teaching them. But in third grade, it's it's really difficult. They're still putting apples. Well, I, I don't know if they're still putting apples in the basket like you saw on the on the slide. They're doing some. Uh, it's the rigor's really amped up by third grade, and we did not have those kids in front of us as often as we would like. And so we think that's the slide. Carrie and her staff are doing. Uh, some some uh, processes that we'll get to on the last slide that we hope to correct that slide as well. But across the board, look at our other slides. Fourth grade, three points, while the state's 16. Four in fifth grade, while the state's 14. One in sixth grade compared to 13. Look all the way over to eighth grade, two percentage points compared to 21 in the state. So our teachers are working, our students are working. And they continue to stay with us, and we really uh, credit our classroom teachers and our principals on the campus with those kind of results. And Mr. McFadden, before you move on, just two points of emphasis. Uh, as again, our board knows, but for our community, the STAR testing is recursive in nature. Uh, your third grade builds off of what you learned in second grade. Your second grade learns uh, builds off of what you learned in first grade. And so think about in third grade, uh, students were in second grade, and then they went home. And you're just starting to learn the fundamentals of basic numeracy, uh, which is important. Uh, and then you basically have no dedicated focused instruction in person for the spring. You come back remote. Uh, and, and so, you know, third grade is an area where this year we've got to make sure that for those students uh, that we not only teach them because now they're in fourth grade, so we've got to make sure they get the fourth grade reinforce what they maybe did not master in third grade and probably go back and pick up some of the things that they didn't get in second grade. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done, but our campuses are on it and focused. And again, as I look at the um, performance compared to the state, um, there's a lot to understand how hard our teachers and administrators are working. The other part to this is that these are proficiencies. So this is all the low level accountability under STAR. There are other areas uh, that speak to a higher level of rigor. Uh, in some cases, um, we actually did better uh, this past year uh, than the previous year, which again speaks to um, what's happening in our classrooms. But we did want to focus on the proficiency because um, you know this is the low bar, but we want to make sure that all kids can meet that low bar. And this is not the first, this is the first time you're seeing this data. We got this data in August, and we've been looking at the low bar, but more importantly than that, we're looking at that meets expectations. 
education and masters, the higher bars, because that's important to our campuses to maintain the high rating. That's actually more important than some of some of these ratings. But this was the comparison point that we could draw. But we we've, we've disaggregated all of our scores just like this for every campus and every grade level, so that uh, our our teachers and our administrators have had that uh, data in front of them. This was just a way to kind of show you where the slide was and where the slide was the worst for us. Uh, if you look at writing, it's going to be no more. We, uh, the state no longer tests this in writing, but we thought we'd look at it. Uh, 5 to 12 and 0 in, in 7th grade, lost no, nothing to 8, point drop. And then science in 5th and 8th and social studies, we saw similar bigger drops across the state while our state. They did drop, we saw a drop across the board, except in two plot two subjects, but uh, they were not as large as we anticipated them to be. And we've already begun, we, we began during the COVID impact of years trying to make up for the time missed when we shut school down after spring break. We had already revamped our curriculum. Our curriculum coaches had already started revamping the curriculum so that our teachers could incorporate that last nine weeks of school into the beginning of the next year of school because we knew uh, that was missed instruction and it's paying off for us uh, in these results. You get to high school, we want to go back. <laughs> high school is interesting. Uh, I can get to go there. Algebra 1, two point drop uh, and a 12 point drop across the, strip, the state. Biology, one point drop and a seven point drop. English 1 and English 2, it's interesting. Uh, we had gains, but also they were significant <laughs> gains for the state as well. Now, our scores are much higher, but it's really weird that the, there were three-point gains in that area over the COVID slide year. So uh, something, obviously, in the test was manipulated that year because that's too consistent to just be by chance. And then history, uh, three-point drop, we were already at 98% of our juniors getting through the uh, the lower bar of history and the state drop five. Now what are we going to do about this? We have a plan to address it in school year 21-22, that's this year. We've analyzed the start data, we've identified the students that are affected. Uh, House Bill 4545 is being implemented by our curriculum department and Dr. Weatherly. Uh, we've uh, putting every student through individualized uh, 30 hours of tutoring, uh, additional accelerated instruction, not just let's help you with your homework, it's actual instruction to help accelerate their learning, and then uh, according to what their results were. In kindergarten and second grade, we're, because of our strategic plan, we added some goals for those kindergarten, first, and second grade years to make sure our students are prepared for third grade, so we're uh, trying to address the gaps as early as kindergarten, first, and second grade as well. So they'll be ready for the, the third grade star. There's something from the state called currency. I wish I could tell you what that stands for. I'm sure someone could. It's a specialized curriculum, an acceleration curriculum from TEA that was designed for COVID slide. It's being used in all applicable classes to help fill in the gaps for students. And then we're reviewing that eighth grade uh, ELA curriculum. The one area of our slide was a little larger than the state's to adjust for the double block that we losing the double block to a single block. Uh, and then uh, additional issues that we're aware of this year, that all districts across the state are aware of this year, is attendance, attendance fluctuations, because kids are out for 10 days or eight days or three days, depending on uh, some uh, family member or contact trace or they are being positive in themselves. Although we've seen very good uh, trends on our COVID positivity rates, according to our trackers. Uh, those are some of the things that we're doing to address the slide. That's not as bad as we thought it would be. <laughs> That's it. Any questions about anything? Is it difficult to uh, accommodate those 30 hours of extra for well, House Bill 4545? I know how to do that. Yeah. Uh, it is. Uh, junior highs, we've always had a class built into the schedule for kids that were not successful in the star, so we've been able to accommodate <coughs> We've gotten a lot of uh, a lot of parents that are waiving the ten the three to one ratio, and so that allows us to use those classes uh, at every level. We've done a little bit different. Uh, they hope they felt all their meetings. They had a deadline of meeting in September to hold their accelerated committee uh, meetings that they had to have for fifth and eighth or third fifth and eighth. Now, like they were the old SSI meetings that yeah. we had for grades and so uh, they're they're well started. In 
to it. So. I imagine that's difficult. It is. It's very difficult. Are there any questions? No. I'd like to make an observation, if you don't mind. Please. Um, I don't, you know, sel seldomly does anyone in a leadership position like to see scores going down, but um, I'm very proud of the work that, that the teachers have done to, you know, minimize the scores and, and help our students learn through, a, through an uphill battle. And the fact that we've got, in some cases, we lost maybe two points and the state lost 21, 19. Um, I'm proud of y'all. So take it for what it's worth and thank you very much. I, I can't thank you enough for all the work that everyone has done. So thank you. Dr. Fuller, just a, another interesting observation. Um, but the majority of our students took the STAR assessment last year. We, because again, having a high rate of our students back for in-person, we didn't see any noticeable decline in terms of the sheer number of kids taking the STAR assessment. I think what would keep me up at night is some of those districts where obviously if the average for the state was a 21 point drop, that means some districts, if we dropped 2% and the state average was 21%, there are many districts that had to have dropped 30, 40%. And that is in many cases where over half of their kids were remote and therefore probably a number of students did not take the STAR assessment. And I would suspect that a number of students who did not take the STAR assessment were probably ones that were going to struggle to be successful anyway. So um, as we're trying to figure out how to meet these needs, uh, how to service the students who qualify under, under House Bill 4545, um, it's not easy, but through the work of our curriculum department um, and our uh, principals and teachers, we have a plan, we're working that plan. If you had less than 50% of your kids taking the test and the kids who did take it dropped 21 to 40 points, that's a Herculean challenge. So I think this will be a very interesting year uh, to be able to benchmark um, how we do this year compared to how we did this past year. And I think that's gonna, be an interesting story to tell. But um, in order to make sure you are successful, it's not just the academic rigor, uh, but it's making sure you have a whole plan for the district and a whole plan on each campus. And again, as we were required to present, even though no district is getting rated this year, um, we still have to report. Um, we also have to uh, send in plans to the state each year. But once again, we're not just doing the bare minimum. We are using our new strategic plan to go a level deeper. And we would like to ask Dr. Amy Busby to share with you our district level and campus improvement planning. All right, good evening. We are going to be um, just kind of sharing our process for our district improvement plans and our campus improvement plans. Um, you have a copy of those in your board book and they probably take up quite a bit of room <laughs> uh, between all of the 10 campuses and the district plan. Um, so under board policy, um, the board's role is to do two things. One is to create the district goals, um, which that is something that has already been done. Um, we worked very, uh, y'all worked very hard on that last year. Um, and then the second part is to ensure that the district improvement plans and campus improvement plans um, are created and reviewed annually um, for the purpose of improving student performance. So um, the purpose of our information item tonight is for number two. Oh, but there's a double number one on there. I just realized that. The second number one is what we're doing. <laughs> District goals. So during last year, we worked on those district goals. Um, these five goals are, were adopted. This is what we use with our strategic plan. This is also what's then reflected um, in our district plan. So of course, focusing on academic achievement, school safety, under finance, finance and operations, uh, human capital, and of course, communications and community service. So what we do is we take that those five goals and we uh, use a program called Plan for Learning to kind of help us organize our district plan. And so that's kind of what you see a screenshot of. Um, those five goals then are put into uh, that program. During this year, um, y'all are very familiar with our process on this strategic plan um, where we take those opportunities to get input from all the different stakeholders, parents, students, community members, staff members. Um, and all of that information then was taken and um, 
created our strategic plan, which laid out those performance um, objectives and then those strategies of how we were going to reach those. And that was something that uh, the board adopted in June, and that was our pathway to Premier. Uh, that was the name of our, is the name of our strategic plan. Uh, so there is a balanced scorecard. Uh, you have heard us talk about that before. We will kind of use that to kind of measure our uh, progress as we work through the strategic plan. Um, and then we also have our district improvement plan, which is, reflects the work that we're doing in our strategic plan. So we kind of have two documents that are kind of parallel with each other. Our district improvement plan, that format is something that's required by the state, so that's why you kind of see that um, parallel uh, documents going on. And Dr. Busby, if someone was interested and wanted to see the strategic plan, could they find it on the website? Yes, sir. They can actually find both of these documents um, on the website. So we have a really great website um, that has the strategic plan. You can go onto that site. You can see the plan itself with all the details, but we're also going to be updating that soon with the um, progress measures so you can see where we are in the stages of each of those um, performance objectives and strategies. And so this next slide kind of shows you how it breaks down after you get into a goal. Each of those goals then has um, the performance objectives listed. So this is the sample from our goal two, the safety one. Um, and then you can see the performance objective there. Um, let's see. And then the KPIs. So in our um, strategic plan, we have those key performance indicators. And so each one of those then is reflected in our district plan as well. When you get into the next level, those are our strategies that we talked about. The one layer that's kind of added into the district improvement plan is uh, who that staff person is that's responsible for monitoring that. So that's added into the plan, and if there's any funding sources attached to it. So if we um, are using any title money or ESSER money or general fund money that we want to allocate to that specific goal, we can notate that in there, and then that kind of helps us summarize it at the end, and we can kind of see where we're spending some of our dollars. Just like we are going to be monitoring the strategic plan, um, we also monitor the district improvement plan. There's a, a quarterly evaluations that are built in, so we'll be looking at that information. Um, we'll take the same information from campuses, departments, um, the survey that's going to be going out. That will give us input that's, all, that's going to let us then evaluate how we're doing on each of these strategies and uh, the little um, so you'll see no progress. You'll see it accomplished with the green circle if we're still continuing it um, or if we're going to, uh, we're finished, so we're discontinuing that goal. In addition to a district improvement plan, each campus has a campus improvement plan. Again, the campus plan reflects the district goals and the performance objectives. Um, strategies describe campus efforts to help accomplish those district goals. So the campus then can add campus specific information, what they're doing on their campus to help improve things in the district as well. Or if they have specific initiatives just to their campus, they can also add those specific things. So included in your board book, you did get a copy of all of those plans. Um, each of these plans will also um, be posted on the MISD website. And then each of these plans will become part of the MISD annual report. That's something we do later on in the year. And um, that's also um, required for us to post on the website. And so that's kind of our process. Um, the next level uh, is the campus improvement plan. So I do have uh, Dr. Bartlett that has joined us. And she's going to kind of share and highlight some things from her campus Lone Star. Thank you so much. Good evening. Um, as we uh, took the strategic plan and narrowed it down to our campuses, one thing that was important to all of the principals is that it is authentic and it's not the big strategic plan and then also we have a plan over here. It needs to be the same plan and so there is um, great alignment with it. There are some parts that will be individualized per campus and you'll see that in the campus plan so that's I'm just going to show you a little bit about how you can uh, determine which one is for the campus and which one 
relates back to strategic plan for all of the campuses. So all of our schools start off with a needs assessment and the needs assessment at the beginning of each campus's CIP will give you that background information. It'll be like some star scores, what their staff looks like, how many teachers they have, the demographics of the students, the mobility rate. Those will be different for each school. And did I go? Oh my gosh, I just like, okay, in the end. Um, <laughs> all right, so that's the, that's the first part in the needs assessment. And they also have place, like I know in ours, we have some things in there about Leader and Me, of course. And so um, Mallory's will have Future Ready, Keenan Lyons, and every school will have a place right here for, to describe their processes and their programs, what makes their school special. And that is a great place for us to get feedback from our staff and to kind of brag on ourselves a little bit. Um, then we too have the same goals, the same five goals, and you'll see that our campus goals are aligned to, the, to those. Our KPIs in the strategic plan are listed as objectives here. It's the same thing, it's just verbiage. But what I know is as we check back each quarter, that's also a way that we're monitoring progress on the strategic plan. That's why it was so very critical that all of these actions and initiatives are aligned. Um, okay, so for example, in our strategic plan, we have 126 strategies. That's a lot of stuff to do um, to help our students succeed. So we can use the CIP each quarter to see which one um, we've already met, which one has a little bit of progress, which one is almost done. So you can look right here on the blue arrow on my slide. If it's a relevant strategy and it was in the strategic plan, then it has an asterisk for all of the elementary schools. That way we made sure that out of the 126, everything that applied to an elementary school is listed in the same place under the same goal or an objective. However, we also have strategies that aren't in the strategic plan because they were appropriate just for our school. So an example is, um, this is one from mine, that our students track their own goals in leadership notebooks. Some schools may have other ways of tracking student goals. This is how we do it at Lone Star Elementary. So when you look at my plan, that sentence doesn't have an asterisk at the end. That's all it means is that's, that's just for us. Um, the ones with the asterisk, everybody has. Okay, so there's another example. Um, I can't even see that far. Grade level goals, we post those up on bulletin boards. This was a lot easier to read close up in my office. Um, but the, the asterisk is just a little way. So here's another example. Some of the initiatives in the strategic plan may not be relevant to certain campuses. Others were not listed in the strategic plan. So you can just kind of see that's an example that has one of each. That top strategy is, will be in everybody's CIP because it's part of the strategic plan that's relevant for all of the campuses. All right, so then every quarter we have the same monitoring that the district improvement plan does and we'll be able to use this data and look at how we're doing. Do we need to come back and change anything? And this isn't a new process. We've done it every year. The difference this year is it's aligned to the bigger picture and the strategic plan. All right, any questions over that? So at the end of the year, um, let's say one campus is doing better in a certain area than another campus. Is there collaboration or sharing that you foresee going on, um, you know, between administrators? I think informally that happens all of the time with us, but I do think a formal review and process is going to happen with the strategic plan because we have all of those uh, practices set up right now. Um, we typically do that. We can see each other's plan, and that's convenient. It's convenient when we're writing them, and it's convenient when you look at it and say, gosh, we haven't done this. How did they already do this? So we can easily pick up the phone. Um, it's nice to have access to that as a principal. But I, I do see at the end of the year looking at the data from this to support how we're doing with strategic plan that there will be some conversation and collaboration with that. And the individual campus plans are online as well? So parents can look at yes. their schools. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's 
fantastic. <laughs> I think they have a great opportunity this year that, um, like she said, they were already collaborating, but we're going to be able to take it to that next level just because of the alignment yes. that exists now that didn't exist in the same way. So um, we're going to be able to do some interesting things that mm -hmm. we haven't been able to do before. Mm -hmm. And it just makes the verbiage very similar, too. We are all, you know, it's it's that thing like everyone in the choir is singing the same song, but if they're right. not singing at the same time, it doesn't sound really great. So <laughs> this way we're all singing at the same time. So when we set up our meetings, either directly with principals or with principals and directors, we have one on Thursday. Um, the agenda is aligned with strategic plan. Uh, we are try to revamp with the uh, guidance of our principals to not have sit and gets where it's just information dump, but it really is authentic development and professional learning. And I know the elementaries are going to be having meetings at each of the elementary campuses. So, you know, not that uh, uh, Kathleen's uh, uh, colleagues have not seen her wonderful campus, but they can tour it with her and put a fresh set of eyes. And then what we want to start developing is problems of practice. Um, so uh, an administrator can say, you know, I'm grappling with this mm -hmm. on my campus. You know, we, we're all trying to hit this goal and strategic plan, um, but we're hitting a wall. And then your colleagues can help you think out loud and maybe they have an answer or sometimes misery loves company, but whatever it takes, mm -hmm. we're gonna get to a better place and a better answer, so. Exactly. All right. Other questions? Well, Dr. Bartlett, Dr. Busby, I wanna say thank y'all. Um, every year that we get these, they're long. They're, the, the board book tonight is 924 pages long, um, and I have dreaded watching and reading the campus improvement plans in the past, but I didn't this time. This was very fun even to watch and, and to see all the work y'all have done and, and to see it culminate in this way. Um, it made for an enjoyable weekend read, so thank you. Weekend <laughs> read. And Dr. Fuller, I want a lot of doctors tonight. I, I want to particularly lift up the leadership of Dr. Bartlett. Um, as you know, she had this little side job last year of uh, co-chairing our task force for the development of our strategic plan. And along with Jess Moreno, and she did a fabulous job. And just as we were getting ready to finalize and present it to the, uh, to the board, I remember uh, Dr. Bartlett saying, you know, we keep on making this focus around alignment. We want what the campus is doing to align with what the district is doing, what the district is doing to align with the state expects. And we should absolutely make sure with the district and campus level reporting required to do a TEA, we need to embed our strategic plan in that to make sure it happens. And uh, she took that task on. And uh, again, it's just uh, uh, incredibly appreciated. I know by our colleagues and, and uh, senior leadership as well, and I know by the board as well. So Dr. Bartlett, thank you. All right, Dr. Morrison, uh, technology department update. So I am as excited about the presentation you're about <laughs> to get um, as any that we presented to you in my tenure here as your superintendent. Uh, the board oftentimes, you know, I'll be I'll at elementary school and a student will ask, what does a superintendent do? And I'm hoping that they give me a good answer because, you know, sometimes I'm trying to figure that out myself. <laughs> and I know you guys get asked, what's the board do? And you say, well, we provide oversight. What does that mean? Uh, and so we started to have these conversations last year in the development of the strategic plan of what would oversight look like? And oversight has to be uh, goals that we have all agreed to, data, both formative and summative, that lets us know how we're doing, uh, to be able to tell our community when we're hitting certain goals and targets and why we think that is, and to be also honest with our community when we don't hit those goals and why we didn't and what we're doing about it. Um, you saw that that is directly what uh, Dr. Bartlett and our other campus principals are doing with their school improvement plans. And though each department uh, in Montgomery ISD probably had a department plan prior, it wasn't a formalized process. Well, guess what? Our departments that support teaching and learning on campuses all now have a department plan. Guess what it's allied to? Yes, the strategic plan with key performance indicators, balanced scorecards, all to make sure that we have that alignment uh, that doctors uh, Bartlett and uh, Busby spoke about earlier. Uh, we needed someone to volunteer to go first and uh, and uh, Amanda Davis was voluntold. No, she jumped up and said we would like to have that opportunity in technology. And, and I'm really excited about that because there are really, really exciting things happening in our technology department. Uh, I'm glad we were able to recognize them because it's the part, uh, technology uh, celebration day. But really what has been happening 
uh, since COVID shut down and coming back and remote and hybrid is just a part of the story, but the continuing iteration and focus and uh, great things happening. I really am excited to have Amanda Davis present to you tonight, the first of the department plans that you will be having this year. Thank you, Dustin. Set the bar high, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for letting me to come and allow this. Thank you for allowing me to come and have this opportunity to present to you all the happenings of our technology services department and digital, digital learning. So, sorry, I have it two places. So our agenda tonight, we're gonna to be focusing on our individual department goals as they pertain to the district goals. So we're going to do all five of them because technology is embedded in every single one. And we're also going to let you know of what deadlines are approaching, what's passed, um, what we have completed, and what's next for our department. So technology has five key focuses. The first is going to be on professional development. Next is gonna be ease of use and accessibility. Customer service, data security and compliance. And finally, asset and financial management. Our first focus is gonna be on professional development and that's where we have our district goal of human capital. Our first departmental goal is to provide adequate and effective opportunities for growth in order to re retain effective personnel and recruit highly capable employees for future positions. So part of this is going to be to, to promote and support our CTE program by hiring four interns, two from each campus, to help us and serve our staff and students at Montgomery ISD. And strategies later in the year, they are color-coded for your viewing pleasure, um, are going to be to provide an opportunity for our current staff to take the Security Plus exam, and also for our technology integration mentors our, and our instructional technology coordinator to go to TCA, Texas Computer Education Associations Conference in Dallas. Um, that was online last year and then didn't happen during COVID, so they are super excited about being able to go and do that one. Our next goal aligns with communication and customer service. And this is really to provide impeccable customer service and community engagement events um, that foster partnerships between our school district and our families. So with this goal, our first strategy is to build an intranet or an internal website to, ho to house all of our employee resources. So this is gonna be a technology Professional development roadmap is going to be there. Um, roadmap for our curriculum and instruction for professional development opportunities will be there, along with where our district employees can access all of their resources. So the employee portal, um, grade book, kind of a one-stop shop, sorry, one-stop shop for all of our employees to go to. The next part is going to be to offer um, two community engagement events partnering with our campuses. The first one's going to be in October focusing on digital citizenship. This is going to be our ed tech plan for this year. Um, you can see that it is aligned with the content that is happening in the classroom. So in February we're focusing on assessments because our teachers are getting ready to start prepping our students for STAR. So what tools can we provide digitally to help them prep their students for STAR? Um, December is also Hour of Code, so we have coding programs that we are going to present during that time. And all of this is developed by our wonderful instructional technology coach. We have also implemented a quarterly ed tech bingo, so that way our staff can learn on the go whatever they're wanting to learn. And we have had over 60 staff members participate and we've given out um, over 450 ed tech badges. So a new one will be presented in October for our staff to be able to complete through December. Yeah, people are really excited about this. Oh, so I nice. happened to be on a campus and I saw all these staff members coming my way. So I'm like, ah, oh, they want to come say hi to superintendent. Felt good. They walked right past me because they were there <laughs> with Diane Teal because they were playing bingo. Yes. <laughs> care less about me, but uh, that's, that's what it should be. So it was good stuff. I was gonna say, I've, I've been seeing things about that on social media, and so that's exciting to see the collaboration and the connection between your department and the teachers. 
And there's been a lot of times when we've been on campuses and teachers are like, well, you know, I did the like initial training, but then I had to go further because I really wanted to use it in my classroom. And Diana's been giving out special prizes for the teachers that are just going above and beyond. So they're super excited to, to participate. Our next core focus is going to be on accessibility and ease of use, which is built into our academic achievement. Um, our first goal is going to be to modernize our educational learning spaces throughout the district with innovative applications and 21st century technologies. This is a kind of a two-part strategy. Um, one, we want to look at a new learning management system, which we're going to bring to you in March to hopefully get a contract going for our next school year. And then the second part of this is going to be to do a BYOD, or a Buy Your Own Device initiative, in order to close the technology gaps that are amongst our MISD campuses. So let's dive into that a little bit further. <coughs> so our first strategy was to do a learning management system. Now, these three systems have to work in tandem in order to be successful together. So if we're looking at purchasing a learning management system in March, we have to look at looking at a new student information system that's going to allow our teachers ease of use so when they are grading assessments or learning in our learning management system, they're not having to enter grades twice. Right? So our student information houses attendance, our grade book, discipline, graduation plans. The next piece of that is going to be an enterprise resource planning system. This is focused on our staff. So we want to make sure that our staffing is correct. We can build our, out our schedules there. We can build out you know, where those teachers are going to be on the campuses through our enterprise resource planning, which then feeds into our SIS and then feeds into our learning management system. So all three of these have to work in tandem for it to be successful. And so we're making sure that we're putting things in place first. We're putting the SIS system and the ERP system in place first and getting that ready to go before we introduce a new learning management system. There's a quiz at the end of this. Too. There is a quiz at the end of this. So as we're getting ready for one-to-one, -one, I'm going to draw your attention to that blue column. So this is our current device to student ratio. Now what this means is that we have one device <coughs> to either three students or two students. In our strategic plan by 2024, it says that we are going to be a one-to-one -one device to student ratio. Now the only problem with this column right here is that there's a lot of these devices that are going to be at end of life cycle by the time we get to 2024 and we will talk about that here in a little bit. So this is kind of leading us into why we want to do a buy your own device program. So our idea is that if we do a buy your own device program, we are basically saying that a device in a student's hands is kind of like a school supply, right? Because we're expecting our students to be online, they're accessing digital resources, they're collaborating online, they're accessing their grades, and so with our I design of buy your own device, we're allowing our parents and our staff, our parents and our families to purchase a device at a discounted rate that's an approved device by MISD. We'll manage it, we'll take care of the warranties, we'll take care of break fix. It's still owned by the parents, so if they decide to leave the district, they take the device with them. Right? If they are needing it at home, they have the device. Now we know that not all families can afford to purchase a device, so there will be multiple options for them, either to lease the device for three years, be able to trade it in, get a new device in three years, kind of like how you do your cell phone through Verizon or AT&T. Um, they can also purchase packages, and so those packages will be geared towards a grade level or a specific content area. So if you're a CTE student and you need a more robust machine, we'll have a package just for you so that way your programs can go directly onto that computer. Which eliminates the need for our campuses to spend money providing devices in the classroom. Now we know that not every, again, not every kid, not every family can, pur can purchase that. So we do have a year-long lease program where parents can put down a deposit on a device and then they will have that reimbursed at the end of the year if there's never been a warranty issue or a reason to have to replace that device. 
Again, this is still going to be serviced by MISD, still owned by, MS, by MISD. For families that cannot afford to put a deposit down on a device, they can do a checkout system kind of like your library books. Again, though, with the library books, there's still fees associated with that if the device comes back or the book comes back damaged. It would be the same thing with the device. So if there's any damage to that device, the parents would then be responsible to pay for that. Or they can have option number four, which is to bring their own personal device in. The only thing with that is that technology services won't have any administrative rights to be able to service that machine if something happens during the school day. That is a long list of So can we stop on this one for a yes. second? Because <laughs> a lot of our families have been asking for this for quite some time. And so the challenge is it's hard for us to service the device that they want to bring. Mm -hmm. So this allows us to negotiate a good price for the family. They get to keep the device, which is something they may want to do in the first place. Uh, but we have multiple options if a family can't afford it. Uh, you know, from leasing to actually providing it. So no student who needs a computer will not have one. Uh, but this is another uh, way to make sure that we stay fresh with technology and that the technology that student needs are not um, in a cycle, life cycle that no district can manage. And so uh, we got a lot of work to do on this, but um, Amanda and team have done a stunning amount of work in a very short period of time, because this is multiple negotiations with multiple vendors operability and making sure all the systems can sync and that you can service these and mm -hmm. so uh and another positive that comes to mind as she read through all that is the responsibility that the family parent and the student feel towards taking care of the device absolutely well and this also allows us as a technology department to focus on classroom technologies right so removing projectors out of classrooms that are outdated and putting in an interactive panel that every student can be able to go in and, and have that engagement or being able to in you know purchase machines for teachers that are robust enough to handle the workload that they're doing in class and at home so we want to make sure that we're putting our money or the district's money in the right place rather than a machine that ultimately is a consumable for students right so our next strategy or our next department goal is to increase the usability of the district's wi-fi network and ease of use for all technologies requiring district authentication so our first strategy that we're working on with ClassLink is to expand the use of single sign-on to remove barriers for accessing learning technologies throughout the year, which basically means that we don't want our students and our staff writing their, their passwords on post-its and putting them underneath their keyboards, right? We want a place that they can go to that houses all of the um, applications that are online for our staff to be able to get to and that way they can have all of their data secure we're also anytime we put anything into ClassLink we're working with the vendor to ensure that our data that we are sharing with that vendor is not going to be breached in any reason for any reason so that way our students data can be secure so it's not being we're not having teachers go out to a random website sign up 30 kids with their birth dates and creating passwords and their last names everything's going through class link to where all of that data is securely stored and Amanda explain the importance for teachers of single sign-on um, well for me as a teacher it was basically getting our class time back you know I don't know how if you know how hard it is to get um, 30 pre cares to sign in online all at once it takes the entire class time <laughs> to get them to sign in so this is a way for them to get signed in quickly and kind of recover some of that class time and it also allows them to just kind of have a one place to store all of their their passwords and again it's one stop shop for that the next one that we're looking at and doing later in the year is partnering with our current network provider to build kind of a guest portal. When you sign in to our guest network, you can basically authenticate as a staff member or as a student, get put on the right Wi-Fi and be able to access our resources 
accordingly. So if a staff member is on their cell phone, they log in through the guest network and they need to post a social media video or post because there's something great happening, they're able to do so on the guest Wi-Fi. This is kind of a special project because of our issues with Lake Creek and Oak Hills and Keenan that do, do not have cellular reception out there. So we want to make sure that when they are on their devices, they can get to the appropriate websites and the appropriate resources that they're using. Our next focus um, is going to be on customer service. So just in the last three months, we have closed over 1,300 tickets. Um, and we have about 200 that are open, but again, that comes and goes depending on the day and what's going on. But of those 1,300 tickets, our average response time was about two hours for first contact. That means a technician or somebody at the district office contacted that person to see what the problem was. And the average close time was about two days. So that's taking into account any time that we have to send a device out to have it fixed, or we have to order in parts, or we have to come back and get parts, or there's special projects that our, our technicians are assigned to do. Ms. Davis, can I make another observation? Sure. I have never seen the technology department be able to provide that level of tracking to <laughs> us before. So whatever y'all did to make that happen, thank you. Well, we have been working with our current system and we're looking at doing a new system in the spring to get a little bit better metrics also. But I also, the data is impressive, the sheer number of tickets and how quickly they're being closed. But what I appreciate that isn't part of the slide is the customer service that Amanda spoke to in the uh, video that you saw at the beginning as customer service. Because a lot of times the answer is not what the person who puts in the ticket wants to hear. Mm -hmm. But instead of just saying, no, we can't do that, you now have that may not work with our systems. It may be a software that's not compatible. Uh, there may be some technology reason why we can't service it the way you want, but then what you get from this department is, what are you trying to accomplish and let's problem solve together because we can probably find a way to meet your need. And so there's no way to capture those data, except there is because we'll do the survey that went out today and we'll be asking for customer survey satisfaction from our employees. Well, I can capture it qualitatively for you guys. I'm, I'm hearing more from teachers that are saying that, you know, yeah, the technician came to me and um, you know, maybe gave me the answer I didn't want to hear, but they did it with a little kindness. They did it with a little, you know, promptness. And, you know, I'm hearing that more. So kudos to y'all and thank you. And it's really important for our teachers because they're here about a great resource and they're saying, well, other school districts use it. Why can't we? Well, then technology will investigate. And maybe the reason is because they sell student data uh, that vendor sells data uh, of those students. That's something we're not going to do. And then when you go back and you tell the teacher, that's what very few teachers are going to say, why well, I still think we ought to use it. But then we can help find another resource. And, and again, that's that part of customer service. It's, you know, it's really hard to figure out how to do the KPI on it. Uh, but it, when you see it and, and you're hearing from your teachers, uh, it's very appreciated. Thank you. So our next few slides are going to focus on one service that is essential, is a core function for us, and that's going to be our data security and compliance. This is not necessarily exciting to anybody else outside of technology, <coughs> um, but it's imperative that we put in preventative measures to protect our students and our staff, you know, data privacy. So our first goal in this is going to be to increase the capacity of our current employees through the education of cybersecurity awareness, digital citizenship, and social emotional wellness digital tools. So in July, we had a few hiccups with this, but in July we implemented a new web filtering service that allows our campus administrators to monitor um, what our students are searching for and what our staff is searching for throughout the day and being able to see whether or not it's a student safety issue or it's a student wellness issue. So if it's something that needs to be addressed by an administrator or maybe by a counselor that they're searching for on that website. And this year is kind of like that pilot year to see how it goes. Um, just so that way they can, again, see what kind of data is getting out of there. If there's a repeat offender that's searching for things or trying to get around the web filter. Um, and then our next strategy is to have 95% of our staff in Montgomery to be cybersecurity awareness trained. 
Um, and that's part of our compliance piece with the state to make sure that we are all getting trained on cybersecurity awareness. And then a few other things will fall underneath that for the next couple of weeks as well. Our department goal number two is to ensure that all students are digitally safeguarded through compliance with SIPA, FERPA, and COPA compliance. So in August, you all voted to um, adopt the new student handbook that has a SIPA compliance information update to it. And in, in October, we are going to start our digital citizenship curriculum um, with all of our staff and students. So our plan for our digital citizenship. Um, and this is going to address our Education Code 28.002Z um, and our House Bill 129 that um, says that we have to train our students to access the internet safely, responsibly, and ethically. So I kind of want you to focus on that middle piece right there of October 4th through October 22nd. So we're gonna have two weeks where our staff is gonna be trained in digital citizenship. And then the week of October 18th, our students will have a whole week of digital citizenship lessons that are customized to either their grade level or to their campus um, that address the needs of that specific group of students. And then on Wednesday the 20th, we have a parent workshop that we are going to schedule to provide resources on how to keep your children safe online. Other ways that we're going to be increasing our data security is we're gonna be strengthening our password complexity in October. January, we're gonna be enforcing our data loss prevention policy. So when registrars send out emails with student transcripts that has student data in there, we wanna make sure that all of those emails are getting encrypted on the way out. In spring, our instructional technology coordinator and select other district employees will be going through the Creative Commons copyright certification, so a lot of C's, um, and they will be building a compliance course for us for the next school year um, in order for our staff to make sure that they are compliant um, using resources and they're not copy, provide, having copyright violations. And then in June, we're gonna start with our district administration and our campus administration, um, rolling out multi-factor authentication for all HR and finance systems. So this will happen once we start with our new our ERP system in order for them to log in. They'll have to have two different ways to log in. So that way their data is secure. So if they are on vacation in Bermuda and they are not, you know, checking their email or they're not logging into our system and they get an alert, they know that they can decline that so that way nobody else outside of our district or no, one, no other employee can have access to um, confidential information. So our last core function is gonna to be to focus on asset and financial management. This is Chris's favorite area, right? Um, so we're looking at reevaluating our managed print service agreement to reduce the spend on our annual printing services and increase support for our managed print services. And we are looking at implementing a mobile device management system and an inventory tracking system to monitor, track, maintain our district assets, and as well as being able to provide innovative solutions for our staff and students to be able to use at home and at school. So looking at our assets, this is our total classroom inventory right now. Um, you'll notice that far right column has an end of life term on it, and there's a lot of red underneath there. So end of life doesn't necessarily mean that they're just gonna stop working tomorrow. End of life means that they are out of warranty, they can't get updates. Um, if they break, we can't find a comparable device to backfill, um, and it's basically the usefulness of that device. So when we look at our desktops, we have 89% of those that are going to be end of life um, at the end of this year because a lot of them were purchased um, about the time that Lake Creek was built, right? So that's when their warranties are going to end. So this doesn't mean that we're just gonna start replacing all of these devices. What this means is we need to start looking at how to build in a life cycle plan to ensure that we are 
purposefully replacing the devices that we need to, and we're being proactive about replacing those. Which leads us to our last goal, um, is, which is developing a life cycle plan for technology infrastructure to maintain the integrity of systems and ensure timely replacement of devices. This is a two-fold um, strategy because we have to look at both the infrastructure and our classroom devices. So our infrastructure, of course, is going to be anywhere from three years to a seven-year life cycle, whereas our campus um, classroom inventory can be replaced about every four to five years. So some of these things can be stretched, some of them, you know, we want to make sure that we're taking care of them before they break and we have bigger issues on our hands. So this is our proposed life cycle plan. Last year we started with MJH and Stewart Creek. We did a few um, campus classroom upgrades and this is kind of our plan of when we want to address either department or campuses. Now if you look at this at the bottom, our campus classroom refresh, so that's including a lab of 30 computers, desktop cameras, projectors, and teacher laptops. If we're looking at doing 30 classrooms plus one lab, that's about $167,000 on average to do that. And that's just kind of baselining it, right? So this is where we kind of want to spend our money because, again, this is where we want to make sure that we're providing innovative solutions in the classroom. This doesn't necessarily mean that we have the budget to do that, but we need to be able to say what's important on this list. Underneath that is going to be our infrastructure upgrades. So when we're looking at our infrastructure upgrades, if you can look at years four and five, we're talking about, we're talking about upgrading our cabling in our classrooms and upgrading our access points. So when we're talking about upgrading our infrastructure pieces, to do a whole campus infrastructure upgrade is going to be about $300,000 on average. So we have to figure out, again, what's our priority right there. When we talk about our infrastructure, though, we do get a little bit of reprieve because we can use our, key, our Category 2 E-rate funds. So we were approved for about $1.5 million of E-rate Category 2 funds that we can use over the next five years. This year, um, we decided to upgrade our uninterruptible power supplies, which means that if we lose electricity, we lose power to the building, our network switches have time to power down before something major happens. Over the next three years, we want to focus that on upgrading our network switches, access points, and how this is calculated is based on our student population and our reimbursement rate is calculated based on our Title I. So we get about 60% reimbursement. So this year we um, used about $63,000 and we'll get 60% of that back for our Category 2 funds for network grades. So just to kind of give you an overview of the projects that we have going on, um, this is a list of everything that we're working on this year. This is not an exhaustive list. It's just kind of like a high-level overview. So these are the projects either that we've completed, we're waiting to start, we're on track with, or they are delayed for reasons outside of our control. And lastly, I just wanted to give you kind of a snapshot of when you can expect technology services to um, put forth an action item to you all. So in October, we would like to have our managed print service contract renewed um, to be able to start rolling those over in January. November, we want to look at our SIS system and our ERP system to where we can start getting that in line for the next school year. Um, March is going to be kind of a, a big one, which is our learning management system contract and also our Microsoft Office 365 renewal. So that price is going to increase because they're, they no longer offer the plan that we are currently on. And then in May, um, we would like for you to view all of the compliance courses that we are creating for the next school year and to be able to approve those so that way we can tweak them and have the summer to, to get them ready for the next school year. So all that being said, do you have any questions for me? 
I do around infrastructure. Sure. So you mentioned every five to seven years, infrastructure has to be upgraded or replaced in some way. Maintenance, yeah. So, so, so what does that mean? Does that mean I hear cabling, I hear access points, I hear switches, I hear all of those things. What does that mean? It means that they're not necessarily out of date, but they're going to go, they're going to get to a point where we can no longer maintain them as they are. So cabling in the walls, if you look at one of our elementary campuses, all the cabling in the walls right now is um, VGA connections. So the little 11 prong VGA that sticks into the wall. If we are upgrading our campus in a, innovat innovatively to have interactive panels for our teachers to be able to use, all of that cabling has to be replaced and changed over to an HDMI. So things like that, um, parts and pieces of those are breaking, and so it's kind of hard to find those parts and pieces because that's an older technology that's no longer being used. So, so is, that, is that hardware or is that infrastructure? That would be an infrastructure piece because, again, you're having someone that's having to run the cable through the ceiling, drill holes in the wall, replace face plates, wire all of that back to whatever device is in the front of the classroom, or wiring it back to a power supply somewhere else in the building. So, so as we're talking about upgrades and we're talking about uh, budgets and, and all these things that we've got to do in the future, I suspect that our infrastructure, when we talk five to seven years, we're five to seven, ten years behind right now, I would assume. It, I'm just making the assumption, but I would assume that we've got some serious gaps at the moment, right? We, we do. A lot of it is going to start coming to fruition probably two to three years from now is we're, when we're really going to start feeling the hurt of what we currently have. So as we, as we start thinking about infrastructure, how do we get away from hard infrastructure? How do we get away from cabling? How do we get to better wireless access points? How do we get to better options where it, you're replacing a single thing as opposed to wiring and all those types of... Well, a lot of the cabling, unless it is broken or it's an older model of a cabling, that doesn't necessarily have to be replaced, but those are where all of our assessments are coming in from our different vendors that we're working with. So I'm having um, like a network assessment done of a heat map of all of our campuses to see where we have weak spots. So it's not necessarily that we have to replace what's there right now. We might have to move it three feet to the left because this room doesn't necessarily need that access point, but this room does. Hmm. So we're trying to figure out what's the best fit for each campus individually versus what's best for the district as a whole. So like Lake Creek, completely upgraded with all of their wiring. They're probably not going to need cabling, but someplace like Lone Star or Stewart Creek, where that cabling is a little bit older, and our, if we, again, if we put the new devices in the classroom versus just the projectors, we're gonna have to take into account that cost. Any other questions? I have a question, but just I'm excited about where this department's going. It's very exciting. I was a teacher in the district before, so a minute ago when you guys talked about how quick you're um, taking care of the concerns of the teachers, I looked at him like, wow, because, I mean, I've lived that before, waiting weeks and weeks for a response or something that you really need. So I'm very excited about the direction and blown away by all of this information. Well, again, that's, that's the entire team. It's not you know, just me at the top, that's every single person that is working campus, our system admins, our assistant director, our te instructional technology coordinator, they are all making those improvements every single day. The fact that I can even ask the questions I just asked is pretty remarkable. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you needed a tutorial on any of that stuff, just let me know. <laughs> Ms. Davis, thank you so much. And I would say to whoever goes next, the bar has been set pretty high. So <laughs> <laughs> but we will be up to that challenge because uh, Ms. Turner just mentioned taking care of our people and uh, Dr. Bartlett mentioned 126 strategies in the strategic plan and one of those strategies is arguably I don't want to say the most important but there are none that are more important than making sure that we have a culture worthy of our students and staff. Uh, we have a good culture in Montgomery ISD, but if you don't tend it, nurture it, care for it, it's like a garden. It's not going to produce the way that you need to. So as we do all these exciting things with technology and star assessment and new innovative instructional programming, at the heart of what we do, we are a people enterprise. And we have to take care of our people. 
and we have to create a culture that they can thrive. And that is really what we want to focus on tonight by sharing with you our initiative that we are calling our culture of respect. And to lead that initiative, we have uh, a stunning uh, person by the name of Teresa Tipton, uh, who is going to share a little bit about what we're trying to accomplish. Teresa. Well, thank you, and good evening. So yes, we are in with the culture of respect. So I'll start out and give you a little background. Um, I share this uh, lead with Amanda and Courtney, who did not move like she said she was going to. But um, these two ladies here that are a uh, huge help to me is with all of this. OK, so our agenda tonight will go over a little background information, committee members, the responsibilities of the committee, and goals of the committee, and then our roadmap. I talk fast, but some of y'all already know that, so slow me down if I get going too, <laughs> too quickly. Our background information. So through interactions with the staff and some meetings uh, with the employees, most, most of them talked about culture and respect. And the employees narrowed that down to what that means and how employees treat and speak to one another and how they felt that their role or their job was interpreted or perceived in the school district. While most thought our culture in Montgomery ISD was strong, the consensus, as Dr. Morrison said, is we want to build on that. If, if it's good, we need it better, um, especially given the fact that our district is, the anticipation is we're going to be growing, and we're already seeing that growth already. Here is a list of the committee members. So um, it's a, a large committee. But this committee does represent every campus and each department within the school district. Um, there's paraprofessionals, there's teachers, support staff, uh, transportation, maintenance, child nutrition. So we've, we've tried to, we got help from principals and directors and tried to make sure that every aspect of this district had a voice. So every, every person should be represented when we're going through all this initiative. Any board members? One board member, <laughs> Ms. Lurie, thank you. The responsibilities for a committee, for our committee members, so there'll be committee leaders and then committee members. The committee members will help the leaders facilitate town hall meetings, SWAT meetings, um, go through the survey information. So the district-wide survey went out today. Uh, we're, we're, that'll be interesting to get some of that feedback because uh, that will come into our play as well. Um, and to be an advocate for the culture of respect. A, lead, a leader will be the ones that actually lead and facilitate the town hall meetings. Um, they'll help us collect the information from the SWOT analysis and help us all to come up with what the definition of a culture of respect means in Montgomery ISD. Um, facilitate and design a culture of respect handbook and along with that policies and procedures um, for conflict resolution. The overall goal of this is that our current and future employees feel that they are respected, that they are heard, and that they are a contributing part of Montgomery ISD being the premier district, um, and that there's policies and procedures that support this move and defines the culture of respect as MISD sees it. Here is our timeline. Now, obviously, things are subject to change. But, so this week, the email went out for the survey uh, that will take, uh, we're, I think we were told the first to middle of October, we should have those results back. But starting tomorrow is our first committee member meeting. So we have three meetings, and we did three to try to accommodate each person's uh, time that they work. Some people get off at 2, some people get off at 3, some at 4.30, some of us never leave at all. <laughs> But um, so our first meeting is tomorrow morning, and then we have two meetings uh, Thursday afternoon here at ESC. Uh, so far, it looks like everyone has responded, and all these people will be showing up to our meetings. On the 14th, we will hold um, three meetings, because we should have our information back at that time from uh, the survey that went out today. This is also where we'll discuss the data there, start to discuss start to discuss that information and go over the SWAT, what that means. What do these SWAT meetings mean? I know some were here 
last year with the SWAT. I know I've got to participate in that and I enjoyed it. Um, I liked the interaction with the employees, so I thought that was a really good avenue to take. And thankfully, every, the others agreed with me on that one. Um, so these three meetings, we'll talk about the data, the campus assignments, we'll try to come up with our lead presenters, and we'll schedule a time with the campuses, each campus and each group, and we can go out and do presentations and do the SWAT uh, meetings. On the week of October 25th, so that is the week that we intend to have all the SWAT meetings. We will intend, and they may be two or three at the same time. So um, we'll break up, hit each department, each department and or campus. We want to make sure there's ample opportunity for everyone to participate. And then the committee meeting is on the 10th. We'll discuss the, all the information collected through the survey and also through the SWAT. And let me back up a little bit. When we get the information back from the survey that went out today, that may tell us that we need to submit another survey. You know, depending on where that, what that information is that we get back, we'll, we'll have to decide if there's another survey that needs to come down that, that hones in a little more differently on different aspects of where this committee is going. Um, on the 20th of January, so obviously November we'll meet, but then you got Christmas break in there, final exams and all that stuff, so we won't meet in December. Starting in January, the three of us will meet with the leads, and that's where we're going to continue to discuss the, the data and begin the process of policy and procedures. Then January up until spring break, we'll have meetings every two weeks to continue that exact avenue, especially with the policies and procedures. Our goal is by April to submit what we've come up with, with our committee, to SLT, and then by May to deliver that to the board. Okay, now we're gonna watch this little video that was put together for the culture of respect. In Montgomery ISD, we are on the journey to be the premier school district in the state of Texas. To be successful in achieving this vision, we must ensure Montgomery ISD is a place where every one of our employees feels respected and knows their contributions to our students matter. As part of this work, we are launching an Employee Culture of Respect campaign in Montgomery ISD. B1 Team Montgomery ISD. Many of you might be asking, why has this become a priority for MISD? As we developed our district strategic planning during the 2021 school year, many brought up the terms like workplace culture with an identified area of growth being centered on employee respect. The different responses varies from how employees treat and speak to each other to how individuals feel their role in the district is valued. While most feel the culture in Montgomery ISD is good, it is important to make sure we don't get complacent. In Montgomery ISD being good, it's not good enough. We want to be great. When employees have concerns, they need to feel comfortable sharing them and confident their concerns will be received with empathy, understanding, and action. The Culture of Respect campaign will be led by a district-wide committee consisting of all levels of our employee groups with representatives from each campus and department. Committee members are individuals who can be honest and open when reflecting on data collected through surveys sent out district-wide. The goal of the committee is to put a plan in place that clearly answers a few key questions. First, deciding how MISD defines a culture of respect. The committee will authentically listen first, then create a plan that ensures each employee group feels respected in their role and what they contribute to our district. The Culture of Respect Committee will create a plan for how employees can address concerns should they feel they are not being treated to the set standard. They will also tackle how to ensure employees feel their voices heard while being assured MISD expects them to come forward and share their experiences when the need arises. As a district, we can't grow from good to great without setting this expectation and make sure each member of our employee base is assured of their value to our district. Every single member of Team Montgomery matters, and we want that to be known and felt by each of our employees. Our district knows that there are two types of employees, those who directly teach and those who directly support the teaching that takes place, and everyone's important. 
Our goal in this campaign is to ensure that the Montgomery ISD culture provides security and affirms the work that all of our employees do and the way that they are made to feel while they're doing it is always valuable. Let's be one team. Questions? I've got a comment. I mean, I I used to I worked for an old airline by the name of Continental Airlines, and um, every year I had to present our working together cornerstone. And it was it was it was interesting to present that, but it was more interesting to watch the transformation of a very bad airline to a really really good and really really great airline. And um, what did that was was what we call dignity and respect and making sure that every employee was treated with dignity and respect, but they also heard. And they didn't feel like they could, um, they felt like they could, t they could talk about anything. Um, and people, and I watch executives listen to the lowest person in the company and, and um, stop a meeting just to listen, to make sure that um, they supported that culture of dignity and respect. And remarkable things can happen when you do that. So thank you for taking this on. And I think this is, I mean, I would argue that it's probably the most important thing. Great. Questions? Well, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tipton. I'm excited. Let's uh, let's get to work. All right, we're getting close, folks. But uh, to kind of cap us off, uh, there are amazing things continuing to happen in our communications department that support all of the various <laughs> things you've heard tonight. Uh, you've heard reference to uh, surveys. You've heard reference to uh, active listening. Uh, and again, just really, really strong things happening in communication and some things we wanted to update you on. Uh, so I present our Executive Director of Communications, Justin Marino. Thank you, Dr. Morrison. I just want to first say that this is a short presentation, but I'm particularly excited because uh, several months ago, uh, these were just items that were being discussed in the strategic plan. And to uh, watch these um, initiatives and strategies really come to surface has been really exciting uh, in my role. So um, we, we discussed a little bit tonight about a survey. Um, and again, this work started with a strategic plan. Uh, Dr. Bartlett uh, mentioned 126 uh, strategies and in initiatives. Well, there were 66 uh, key performance indicators. That's a, that's a lot to measure. Um, and <laughs> several of those required some baseline survey data. So starting today, uh, approximately noon, uh, that work began. Um, a survey went out to all staff, uh, all parents and students, uh, secondary students, uh, surveying the various issues that required um, uh, baseline data in the strategic plan and some other areas that we felt was uh, prudent to, to measure across the district. Um, we plan to keep the survey open uh, until October 5th. However, there are certain um, industry best practices that we do want to meet. We feel confident that we will uh, get the participation. We've been communicating this uh, very um, aggressively, and um, we really want to emphasize that the responses are confidential. Um, this was one of the uh, core reasons we did partner with a third party. Um, they're only providing us the data uh, and the number of responses. They're not providing who responded. Uh, in fact, we received over 400 responses uh, just today um, in the first day. So we're really excited about that level of participation. Are there any questions before I move on? So I just want to reiterate, when you're saying it's confidential, you mean that company knows who sent it to them, but MISD doesn't know that information. Yes, yes. Right. We, we are only provided the, the data and the number of responses that come in. They are not providing us information on who responded. Uh, let's talk. Um, this is our new two-way communications tool that was launched on September 7th. Uh, this was a strategy uh, under goal five of the strategic plan. Um, we're really excited about this. There's been um, a significant amount of participation from community members, parents, staff members. Um, we've gotten 71 dialogues so far since September 7th um, from 58 unique users. So, so folks are, uh, are definitely taking advantage of this opportunity to communicate with, with district leaders. Really proud of the team on response rates so far. Um, 
Our average is, we're getting back to folks on an average of half a day. The uh, national average through the platform is over two days, so we're doing very well uh, in the early stages of it. Our response, um, our customer service rating uh, is 9.6. Anytime a dialogue is closed out with a customer, they have the opportunity to rate our customer service to them. They may not particularly like the answer we provide, but we hope that we provide good customer service in doing so. So uh, we do have a um, 9.6 customer service rating. We hope to keep that up above the national average of 8.4. And then finally, um, we have launched a, an employee culture of respect campaign that is in, align with B1, in alignment with B1 team called I am Montgomery ISD. Uh, this is a, a snapshot from our website. Um, on, a, on the home page of our new website is a, um, a button that says I am Montgomery ISD next to the transparency button. And it, it takes you to a page where we're highlighting um, employees that are oftentimes behind the scenes and they, they are directly teaching, but they are supporting teaching. So we want to make sure that we uh, lift up all employees in the district and make, you know, just ensure that they feel that they matter because they do. Every single employee in this district matters. And I'd like to um, play the second uh, video that we've launched for I Am Montgomery ISD. <coughs> Hi, I'm Pam Barkas. I'm the manager at Lake Creek High School, and I enjoy every single minute of it. Yeah, let's have how many um, spices? My role here is basically making sure that we have all the product that we need in the kitchen. I want to make sure I have the things that the students want to eat, the things that they enjoy. Our foods look beautiful, they taste great, and we know that they're getting exactly the nutrients that they're required to have to make sure their brain and their body works correctly. I moved here from Illinois, and what attracted me to this area is my husband moved to his job to Conroe, and we were asking all the people in the area, you know, where should we go to a school, and all we heard was Montgomery ISD. I applied online, and I got a call that exact same day, and I've enjoyed every minute of it. Thank you. I am Montgomery ISD. So once again, throughout the school year, we'll be highlighting uh, the various amazing employees across the district, and we're really excited about that initiative. Questions? I'm just, I mean, I, I, I love this. This is great. I mean, I, I, just to recognize our employees, to support our employees, making sure we're giving the tools to do what they need to do. I mean, it's, they do remarkable things. I mean, look at these star scores, despite all the, all the challenges. I mean, that's, that comes from all of this, all those initiatives. As Justin said, I think he said it really well, but, you know, all the planning and putting up strategies and, you know, a lot of times strategic plans aren't worth the paper they're printed on and, you know, RSS electronic and various different forms, but the strategies all have owners and they're starting to populate and they're all critical to create that focus of being the premier school district in the state of Texas. And we don't get there without our employees, so to highlight them and to recognize them for the amazing work that they're doing and make sure that uh, they work within a culture of respect, that they're compensated well, and that they're supporting well, that's the most important focus we can have. So, and then communicate the heck out of it and celebrate them. Yeah. And this is just one way to do that. Well, we have a few members of the public joining us tonight, and for those watching online, I'd ask, you know, let's get behind this. Um, this is something that, that I think will change our district, and for the better and I'm all on board with this personally I think it's a great idea and I want to thank everybody for their hard work board members are there any other questions are there any questions about the monthly financial report Dr. Morrison anything else no sir all right with that I'm going to I'm going to call this meeting uh, concluded at 7:39 p.m. thank you <laughs>